All right. Uh, so thank you for coming today, and uh, thank you for people now to put me on the big, huge room like this, so that I can get more nervous. <coughs> so uh, maybe I will try to start. Okay. Today we are talking about a topic which is the decup tuple in React Native. So uh, we. Uh, so last, last year I made a presentation and the demo didn't work. So this time I think that I can improvise it by shipping the demo to everybody before the presentation. So that is what I did. So I built an application for Drupal and it is now available on App Store and Play Store. So you can download it and follow the session. So today we are talking about the technology behind it and how we build it. So first, uh, my name is Robert. I'm now working at Evolving Web. I'm a full stack developer. I have been doing Drupal since 10th year. And I have been working with Swift for the last two years, Gatsby from last year until now, and React Native from last year. And you can find more information about me on the Evolving Web website or on my personal site, which is the Gatsby site. Uh, first, I, I would like to talk a bit about Evolving Web. So we are a web agency in Montreal. We have about more than 10 years experience working with Drupal. And we are a very community-centric. We organize a lot of events like Drupal Meetup, UX Meetup. Meetup. So if you, if you want to get more information about all the activity of Evolving Web, feel free to check it out on our website. Uh, here are some pictures of us. This is the environment of work at Evolving Web. We have fish, we have food, we have friends, we, we smile, and sometimes we work. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, so let's get started. It's about decup trouble with React Native. About this project, I want to build a, cr a cross-platform mobile application that consumes data from drupalnode.org. And that will be a very simple application where you can see all the information of Drupal, all the information of the event, like the location, the list of session, the schedule, and the list of sponsor. And I set the goal for myself on this application is to minimize the server development, which means I would like to use the JSON API data as much as possible. The system, the system we have the server, which is the Drupal host on Pantheon site, and we have the mobile application where I use React Navigation, Redux, Redux Tongue, Animate API, and Fastlane. I will talk more about it later today. Let's go with the server. So on the server, I so the website, the Drupal No website, is developed by Foster Interactive. So a few months ago, I sent an email to Foster asking if I can access the website. So they are very, uh, like, they, they give me an environment so that I can work with this. So that's, that's how I can access the website. And then I, what I need to do is just to go there, install a few modules, do some configuration, and then I can get all the data from there easily. So first, let's talk about JSON API. Uh, have any one of you never touched JSON API? Only one of you? A few of you, yeah. Uh, have any one of you never touched JSON API? No? Never? Yeah, never touched oh, it. Yeah. So, okay. So I will have a quick explanation. So first, JSON API, what is JSON API? It's like a specification for API in JSON. So let's say you need to build a decup system and the backend developer will argument with the front-end developer on the way how they want to output data. So let's say you want to structure it this way, you want to structure data this way, or the front-end want to structure it this way so that they can parse it easily. So they will just keep arguing about that. So JSON API is a specification. There's no argument anymore because you need to follow the structure defined by JSON API. And in Drupal, we have a 
JSON API module, what it does is we provide an API that's centered on the Drupal entity type and bundle. So that after enable the module, you can access all the information of Drupal entity, like out of the box. Like you can just call JSON API node article and put in the UUID, and then you get all the information of that node, for example, the title, the body, the creation time, the user who create it. The question with JSON API is, outside of the box, it will not give you the relation data. For example, you have a content type. In that content type, you have a few, an image field that reference to a few entity. So JSON API will not give you it right away. You need to use the include reference. The include reference is, can you see my pointer? No. Can you see? Yeah. Okay. So uh, in order to get the information of the few image in the node article here, I will need to get include few image like this. And JSON API will return you the object of the node and the object of the image. And then after that, you will need to normalize it yourself. You need to manipulate the data the way that you want so that you can display it on the app. You can find out more information about the way to fetch resource from uh, JSON API in this link here. The next part of the server setup is how can I query the image with image style? Because I don't want to get the original image, which is huge. So in order to do that, I need three modules. The first one is JSON API Extra, which will have you to customize the API, override the resource, and enhance the, enhance the fill output. The second thing I need is the module name customer, a consumer. The consumer will help you to identify where do you come from because you are browsing data of Drupal site from the application. So the Drupal need to know who you are, what is the run, what is the type of the content that you can access. The third one is consumer image style. That will help you to override the output of the image field and so that you can choose, okay, I want this field to output at this uh, small image style. Uh, there's a reference link here to the, an, a very, very well detailed article about how to use the consumer image style. You can check it out. So first, let's talk about the JSON API extra module. To configure, just go to this link, admin config service JSON API resource type and select a resource that you want to override. In my case, it will be the node article. And I want to override the few image in that node article. And I can show you the screenshot of how it looks like right here. So when you go to that link, you go to that few user pictures here, you will see the image style here. And then you can select to output the speaker big and speaker small through the JSON API. Let's, let's go to the consumer module. <laughs> the consumer module, will need, you will need to do some configuration so that it can output the image style that you need. To, go, to do that, you need to go to the admin, oh, sorry, admin configs service and consumer. By default, consumer will create a default consumer. You can use it if you want or if you are more secure about which application can consume your data, you can create a new consumer and define the restriction on that consumer only. For example, you can set the role for that consumer, you can set that consumer to access the image of speaker small only, not everything. So you can configure that kind of thing. And if you create a new consumer, then you need to make a call with the ex consumer ID where you need to put the UUID of the consumer here so that it understands where do you come from and what you need, and it will answer you. The output of that, the output of on the setup will be like this. By default, by default, JSON API, API will not give you the image, image speaker big and speaker small here, but with on the setup that we have done, it will give you this link, and then you can use it in your application. 
without blowing up the data. So let's go to the next part. Sorry, I have a question. Am I, am I going too fast or you want me to slow down or something? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I will publish the slide after this, yeah. So let's go to the second part, which is quite interesting, which is the mobile app. So when I, when I decide to build the app, I think about build it, building it in native code, which is Swift, because I like it. But I think I'm, I'm an iPhone user, but I think many people, many, many of us are using the Android phone, so need to build something for them. And React Native is a good solution because you can build cross-platform for Android and iOS at the same time. You can share the same business logic in React code and then build it in two applications. And have any one of you built any React Native application before? Are you familiar with the technology? You personally? Yeah. I mean, I was, but that was like two years ago. Date, yeah, I think it has changed a lot. Yeah. Um, okay, so for this application, because the 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 timeline for this app, this project, this small project, is very sensitive and is very short. So I want to keep everything very simple, and I don't want to use any like any third party package that can cause some problems. So I try to use the big packet only. So in this one, I use React Native, the main framework. I use React Navigation for swiping around the screen. I use Redux for state management. I use Redux tongue for async call to the API. And I spend some time on the anime API in React Native. And lastly, I will talk about the fast lane, which is a way to build and release the app. The first part, which is the React navigation. So uh, you are using iPhone, you will need to go, you always see something like the bottom top bar like this, or sometimes you will see something like this in the top and you can swipe between the, the, the screen. And then sometimes you can see the back button here. When you click back, it will swipe back to the previous screen. So all of that can be done using React navigation. So the good thing with React navigation is the framework is very major. The second thing is will, it will give your application the same look and feel because it worked really well with the native code. And on the animation on the chester work perfectly with the React navigation. Uh, React navigation come with different type of navigator. So the first one is Stack Navigator, which is I'm using here. Stack Navigator, Stack Navigator will give you the going back button here on the second screen. The bottom tab bar navigator will give you the five uh, tab at the bottom here. And the material tab bar navigator, I think they name it because that is something from Google. That will give you the June 12, 13, and 14. Here. The next part of the project is React Redux. So React uh, Redux is the, like a technology to have you build application in JavaScript. It helps you to build the predictable state in application. Because as you know, in, 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 in mobile app, it's very important to know the state of app, what data you already load and what data you want to load in the next step. So Redux is the, it, kind of that thing, the predictable state container for that. And React Redux is just the official binding for Redux. Um, in, on the right hand side we have a, a screenshot. What does it mean when we say predictable state? Predictable state, as you can see here, I'm doing one action which is the fetch article to set. Oh no, <laughs> one action which is set, uh, fetch article. And in that, we can see that the previous stage, it will say the article, we don't have anything inside the article part. And after doing the action to fetch article with success, we will have some information in that object. We have the last fetch, which is the timestamp when you fetch it. 
when the data are received by the app. And we have the node, which, which is the information of on the node that we get from the server. The next part is just the React tongue. So React tongue will have you create a middleware so that you can connect to the server. Because this is, this is just a, a definition that I get directly from Wikipedia. But I think it's quite important to understand what it is. So it will delay the calculation, delay on the action afterward until when the result is successful and get. So Re Re Reactant will do that part for you. It will dispatch the action to call the server and wait until when you get the data, either it is success or failure, and then you can do the next thing, which is display the message or display the content. And together with that, I use the JSON API normalizer it's to restructure data from the server. The, the image on the right hand side is the way that I implement it in our MyCode. As you can see, I have the cone API, which is a, 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 a wrapper function that cone to the server. And the endpoint that I call it JSON API node article. I also pass in some uh, parameter, like I get the 10 latest one, and all of them need to be published and include image in here. After that, I will get the JSON, which is the output of the JSON API. But right out of the box, I cannot use it right away. I need to normalize it. I need to restructure it the way that I can put it into the screen. So I use the normalize function from the JSON API normalizer. And I do some uh, data manipulation in here. When on the fetch has been success, I will dispatch a message saying that the fetch has been done successfully, and here is the data. Go update uh, the UI. Or if there is a problem, I will I will dispatch the failure message. So this is what happened when we do those three actions. So in the reacting, reacting there is a con convention to have three dispatch whenever you make a call. The first one is to announce to everybody, I'm about to fetch the data right now. It is dispatch, fetch, article begin. It has nothing to do, but it just update the state of the app to tell that you are doing one action. The second part, the second step is to dispatch the fetch API success if you get the data. In this case, on the right hand side, I have fetch data correctly, uh, successfully, and I got the payload in the action here. And then it will be passed to the stage of the app. Uh, if we have a problem, we will dispatch another message for the failure. Uh, talking about the normalized JSON API. So, uh, how to say, so imagine that each of us, each of the body here, is a node object. And you want to send three nodes from this point to that point. That is what you do when you call the, the server getting the three nodes, let's say. So, the Drupal, instead of shipping the whole body like this, it will be cost effective, it's not good. So they will decide to cut out your arm, cut out your leg and put on your arm into a basket of the arm, put on your leg into the basket of the leg, and put your body into another basket. So, and then it ship the three baskets all together into the, the point B, the destination. So the app is the point B, the destination. We get the three baskets, but how can we glue everything together? And that is JSON, the normalized JSON API will do. Uh, so this is the first part. Here, this is the output from the server. We have the data like this, and we have the attribute in there, which has on the, on the node attribute, for example, the body, the creation time, the user, the user ID only, not the user information. And we also have... So basically, the, the output of this one is not enough for normal case. You get the information of the node. What if you want to display the information of the user who created that node? So you need to make another reference. It will, 
Oh, in this case, oh, in my in my case, it will be the phi phi here because in the node article I have a phi field, a phi image, a, a few image. Sorry, sorry. And the JSON API will not put it inside the the this object. It will put the image into an include here. And the job of the normalizer is to glue this file field into the correspondent node correctly. On the step two, after running the normalizer from the JSON API normalizer packet, it will transform your data into this form. It will return you the result, which is the list of the article. And it put everything into an object here so that you can, you have a better structure of it, but it's not exactly what you need because it didn't, it didn't put the file into the node correctly yet. That's why I need to have another step to manu manipulate the data that I need. So this is the final <coughs> output of the data that I want to have in, in my app so that I can display on the UI. As you can see here, I have the, uh, where's the few image? Okay, I have the few image here. In this few image, I already have the real image object where I can get from the file file, from the include part I put in there already. So now that we have all this beautiful data, we can start binding it into the UI. Uh, so that is the third part about fetching data using React and Redux term. Uh, let's go to another part of the application. The main goal of this application is so that you can bookmark some session that you are interested in, and then you can find more information about that, like the information, the description of the session or the person who will give the speech. Uh, so in order to do that, you, that, you need somewhere to store the ID of the session that you bookmark, and we can do it using async storage. On the real application where you need to store complex data, you will need to choose another solution, for example, watermelon, watermelon DB, um, SQLite, or something else. Uh, this is an example of um, how we can save the session. So I will pass the session ID in here. I will get the list of the existing session, if it is known, just pass known here, and then push it in there and then set it into the accent storage that is. This is quite straightforward. Do you have any question for this? What is async storage? Async storage is like uh, an API that gives you access to the, the, the local storage of your application. Yeah. So you can store some uh, simple data in accent storage and you can retrieve it in your app. Usually we will use it to store the setting of your app. Let's say in your application you want to receive notifications, so I will store the flag of receive notification in the access storage. Yeah. And because, uh, because access storage will store everything at a string, so I need to stringify the session ID because that is an array, so I stringify it. So is, there really, is it related to what's happening? Uh, it's similar concept, but uh, it's different. Yeah. It's just for the mobile app. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the second part, I will talk about it quickly, which is the caching thing. So uh, we don't want to keep fetching whenever you open the screen. So I implement a, 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 a method named should fetch article or not. <coughs> Because remember before, whenever we fetch data, whenever data received successfully, we set the timestamp for the last fetch. So I will use it to check if in the last five minutes, did we fetch anything? If we already fetch it, don't fetch anymore. Just read it out from the state of the app. If we don't have any information of the node, or if it is out day, it is more than five minutes, then let's do the fetch. And what, what, will we, what will we do when it fetch? Oh, no, sorry. Uh, the next step, uh, after implement the should fetch API, I have another function, another method, which is fetch article if need. 
which is just a wrapper of on the logic that I put in there. So first is we'll check to see if it need to fetch or not. We will pass the, the state of the app in here to decide, okay, should I fetch or not? If it is yes, then fetch it. Um, so talking about caching here, this is a very simple application, but in real world application, it will not be that simple. And there's, there are other things, for example, if you use a watermelon DB, you want to store all your data that you fetch from the server into the watermelon DB, and you will have all the caching strategy for that. Maybe, maybe in that solution, you don't need to normalize your data. Because remember the normalized step that I mentioned before. So the way that JSON API cut your arm and your body and put it into the basket, it has an advantage, which is, let's say, two not sharing the same reference image. And let's say we have two body here. We have the same, we're sharing the same leg here. So whenever, if we, if we keep the JSON API data structure, whenever the server update something on that person, it will update the information of the image, which is shared by multiple node, and then you don't need to update it on individual node. Like, when you update one of them, the sharing part will be updated, and it will be reflect automatically on, on the other instance. So, caching on the real world will be a bit more complex than this. The Next part, uh, it's just a fun part. Uh, so we want to do some animation like this. Uh, so in order to do that, I use the Animate API from React Native. So this is from a library from React Native. I don't need to install any third party packet or anything. <coughs> um, how to say, okay. Uh, first, I must say um, I need to thank uh, Mikhail, even though he's not here, because he's the person who implemented the animation on this one. Uh, let's go to see how it works. In order to make it work, we have a sprite image like this, where we define 27 state of the star. And in the code, I will define, as you can see here, we have the input range from 0 to 27, which is 27 stage, and the output range will be the offset of the image. Like, if you are in stage 1, you will offset the image to the left 40 pixel. Stage 2, offset to the 80 pixel. Uh, the way that is look is like this. So this is the stage 1, stage 2, and stage 3, stage 4. The way that we build is will be an, a component like this, it will be the, the green square. What, that is what you can see. But after that is the sprite. And it keeps scrolling from the left to the right so that you see different image. And here's how we implement it. We use the API, uh, the animate API, and run 20 animation at like one after, after the other. And on each animation, we, after running it, we will delay 40 milliseconds. So at the end of the day, we have 20, 27 stage multiplied by 40 milliseconds. So on the action, when you click it, it will happen in one second, or rather. And I must say that this animation is inspired by the, the like an animation of Twitter. So we didn't invent it. Um, the last part, the last part will be the build and release application. So if you work with mobile development, you will see that the deployment step is quite painful and it consumes a lot of time. Whenever, whenever you want to build a new application, you hit the button and you need to wait for Xcode or Android Studio to build a packet for you. So usually it will take me like 10 or 15 minutes or 20 minutes to finish the process. And after that, we need to upload the file into App Store or Google Play Store. It takes a lot of time. A lot of time. And then after that, I submit, review, and run out to the store. But with FastLand, which is the solution that I'm using here, we can, we can kind of minimize the work on the first three steps. 
So we only need to run one command and it will do the three step for you. And all you need to do is just to submit to the Google App Store or, or, uh, or you need to submit the app to review. So uh, Fastland, Fastland is, um, I think Fastland is a project backed by Google and it's just quite powerful when it is, uh, you can use it not only with React Native application, you can use it with, you can use it with native application as well. It's just a tool to automate all the steps that you need to release the app. So as you can see here, it will, for example, this is the build for the iOS version. First, it will build the AP, IPA file, and then it will upload to TestFly. TestFly is like a testing platform of Apple so that you can share the app within your college or within your tester. They can test it before you run it out to everybody. So here we build the app and we upload to test flight and we will wait for it to process it. So when it when when fa when Fastland finished running you will see some message like this and this will list out all the step that it has done. Like it will increase the build number, build the app and upload to Fastland. And you will say it's very cool to say that you save ni nineteen minutes. And when I build this application, I have been building multiple build, multiple version of the app, and I must say, Fastline saved me a lot of time. Not to mention that you need to build for iOS and for Android at the same time. So it takes a lot of time to do that thing, but with Fastline, if, every, if, if all the configuration are done right, you just need to hit one command and it will do everything for you. Uh, lastly, this is the link where you can download the application, which is on App Store, on Google Play Store. And do you have any question, please? Yes. How many times does it take you to, to do a, a whole app like that? Uh, That's a very, very good question. Yeah, I, the first one that I met, uh, I must say that the app is not very perfect. We still have some work in there because I did it in the rush. And uh, I think I started like uh, two months ago. Yeah, and I work on it half hour, like after work and uh, during the weekend and on and off. But it's not, I must say that not only me working on it. Uh, there's Mikio, who is the developer who make the animation. We have some designer head with some styling and we discuss like on and off. It's yeah, I just I don't want to put you in the corner. It's just because I, I want to know if it's accessible for everyone who would like to jump in uh, in such a. I find it. A, it's not a big project, but for me, it's something very interesting to do. But uh, I don't know if, let's say, I'm not really uh, used to React JS. Uh, um, I think it will take you. I think it will take you a while because learning React is. I find it super hard at the beginning. Mm -hmm. To be honest, I have been with React for like two years, but React Native, I have been with it for more than a year. Yeah. But on and off, and from the beginning, I cannot get the way that React works. But I just keep trying and trying, and then when you get it, everything makes sense. Yeah. But the learning curve is quite steep. I would recommend you to do some simple application. This is considered a bit uh, more than easy. Yeah. Yes. Um, did you, so did you need to use uh, Xcode or Android Developer Studio? Uh, you don't, or you well? don't really need to use it. Okay. But uh, sometimes you will need to open it in Android or Xcode to build the app to see it. Okay. And for this application, it's very simple, so we don't need to dive into the native code. But on other projects where I have the push notification, I need to do some customize in the native code so that you can receive the notification when you are on the forefront. So this would be good if you know a bit of this and that. But it wasn't, it wasn't required? Like that wasn't it wasn't required. Okay. Yes. After your thoughts, the 
do I think about React and Vue? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, <coughs> people ask that question quite a lot, but I'm not very deep into Vue, so I cannot say about that. I, build, I, I work on it on one project, but um, I think it's quite useful, it's quite cool, but maybe I don't understand much about Vue.js to compare. And the fact that uh, React Hook has, has been released uh, not long ago, I think if React is perfect for me right now. I mean, <laughs> just a personal idea. Yeah. Yes. has been involved quite a lot. The app that we are building here is not some hybrid application because the way that React Native works is we we'll, is we'll compile and translate all the JavaScript that you wrote into the native component. So that is the real one. So in terms of look and feel, both of them are the same. But I, I think that when you have to work with some performance heavy application, then the native code will be a lot better. Yes? Um, you didn't mention uh, mm -hmm. debug. Uh, debugging in the React native application is quite straightforward. You can console log it everywhere, and you can see it in the console log of the Chrome. So whenever you run, let's say, run React native, mm -hmm. run Android or iOS, yeah. it will pop up the simulator, together with it you will have the browser open on localhost 8081 and yeah. then you can see on the output that you want to print out. The simulator in like which? The simulator, that is the funny part. So the simulator of iOS come from Xcode, right. the simulator of Android come from Android Studio. So, so in order to run it, you need yeah. to open Android Studio to run the simulator. So you do need to debug it, you need those to refine. Yes, correct. Is there, can you do any of that debugging in, um, are you familiar with Visual Studio at all? Oh, uh, sorry, VS Code? Sorry? Microsoft VS Code is an editor. Um, no, never mind. I just, like, I was just wondering if there's alter, because I mean, if, if you're on Linux, for instance, yeah. like, I'm not going to have, exactly. I'll never run Xcode. So, which is sort um, of a problem. I think, I'm not sure that you can build iOS up outside of Apple. Right. Maybe okay. there's a way, but I, I am going to try it. Okay. Maybe you will run into some problem that is just very hard to figure out. I'm not sure. Yeah. 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 Any question? So, uh, I'm not sure about the time. Maybe this is, uh, this is the end of my session. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, before that, uh, before we uh, we finish today, I would like to uh, show you a few more slides, which is about about evolving web. We have uh, we are offering a few training session on September, October, and November here. If you need any help, feel free to reach out one of us here. So thank you. Thanks, Robert. Thank you.